Thank you very much, everyone. It's always a challenge to be the last uh, group at the end of the day, but I appreciate your interest, your attention, and in the effort of making sure we make good use of your time, I'm not going to go through detailed bios for each of the speakers. Those are well documented in your information package. So I'll just briefly highlight who our speakers are in this panel. The focus of this panel is more on the evidence users and the knowledge users. And we've deliberately chosen panel, panel members who are on the front lines and who are using evidence. And we've got representation from emergency physicians, a family physician and a uh, patient advocate. So to uh, start from right to left, um, or actually your left, my right, uh, we've got Brian Hallroot. He's an emergency physician and he kindly agreed to uh, speak and participate in the panel on short notice. So we really appreciate that. And he's an emergency physician from the U of A and he is the, uh, the senior medical director for the emergency SEN as well as being involved in an academic role. So thank you very much to Brian. Alan Bailey is a family physician. His practice is in Stony Plain, and he is um, an advocate for primary care reform. He has been on the board for the Westview PCN, and he's been involved as a previous chair of the uh, PCN leadership uh, uh, planning moving forward. And Deborah Prose at the end is uh, an important person that we have, uh, many of us have met previously. She is, has got legal and social work training and she's currently since 2014 the Alberta Health Advocate. And that role came about as a result of some very unfortunate circumstances in about 2004 regarding a, uh, an incident with her mother and a medication error that caused her mother's early and unexpected demise. So she has spent the, her career since then advocating for patient safety. And so what we've asked each of the panel members to do as evidence users is to discuss and share with us some of the barriers to implementing the evidence that uh, is created and how they've been able to do that in the roles that they play. So if starting from Brian, then Alan, and then Deborah, we can ask them to spend five to seven minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation. Can you hear me? Thanks very much for the invitation to participate. I'm very interested in the topic of stewardship of healthcare resources and, and trying to uh, make the care we provide, specifically in the emergency departments, as evidence-based as possible. I, I, I have an opportunity to hopefully accomplish some of that as the medical lead for the emergency SCN. Also, I'm a member of the, the committee that sets the our national specialty committee us specialty society guidelines for the Choosing Wisely program. Um, there's been uh, um, some very important topics discussed. I'd like to kind of flip it from the macro to the micro and to the coal face and to the clinician, whether it be a physician, nurse practitioner, other healthcare professional uh, making the decisions. And we talked a little bit about low value care, but I, I think it's important to consider what exactly we mean by that. We, we don't mean inappropriate care. And um, an article out of the um, Australian Medical Journal by a Dr. Scott, a faculty member at University of Queensland, and a name familiar to you, Dr. Stephen Duckett, uh, wrote, resonated with me. And they defined low value care as the use of an intervention where evidence suggests it confers no or very little benefit on patients or risk of harm exceeds likely benefit, or more broadly, the added costs of the intervention do not provide proportional added benefits. They emphasized in their article that very little of the care provided is actually no value, but uh, as you have to make decisions and trade-offs with how you allocate health resources, um, trying to focus on, on maximizing the uh, uh, return to our patients. One of our mandates for this panel, I think, was to take a look at a little bit about what we can do to maybe uh, improve our, our chance to do the right thing. Um, and I pondered about this, and it has been a bit of an enigma for me, because clinicians, by and large, are, are very interested in providing excellent care for their patients. And with the goal that you don't get up in the morning as a doc to say, well, how can I provide mediocre care for my patients? I'm starting my shift in the emergency department. Uh, how can I um, be mediocre today? But <laughs> given that, we still make, all of us as clinicians, make some determinations about providing low value care and uh, as a therapeutic or a diagnostic intervention, and that has significant implications to the system. 
So I, I think it's really quite useful that we focus as well on thoughtful inquiry and research into root causal factors as to what drives utilization of low value investigations and uh, interventions. Um, I profess no expertise in this area. I'm a motivated student and I'd like to share with you a couple of concepts that maybe some of you in the room are familiar with. I certainly wasn't until I started looking into this a little bit more. One of the opinion leaders in this area is Pat Crossgary. He's a, a professor of emergency medicine at Dalhousie and an expert in patient safety and clinical decision making. And he focuses on sort of the basic psychology of, of the modes we make decisions, uh, whether it's type one, type two decisions, automatic or controlled, intuitive or analytic, wh however you categorize them. A lot of our decision making as clinicians, if it's in the automatic or intuitive, we do things based on our uh, experience, our uh, knowledge, and it's relatively reflexive and, and somewhat auto autonomous and often subconscious. Um, Given that, um, it's important to recognize the whole concept of cognitive biases. And this was kind of an aha moment for me when I started reading around this. Um, Scott, oh, the, oh, one of the authors of the article I referenced before, um, described cognitive biases or systematic error that's driven by psychological factors, which can distort uh, both probability estimation and information synthesis and steer clinicians towards continuing to believe in or deliver care that robust evidence has shown to be of low value. Thus, um, some of we need to consider how some of these cognitive biases might influence us as, as clinicians. And most of the cognitive biases, my understanding, influence that reflexive or automatic uh, type one kind of decision making. And because they're relatively unconscious, they're not at the surface, not as part of our, our um, readily identifiable thought process, sometimes they are very difficult to change. It's not like just putting a poster up on the wall of the emergency department and changing my behavior. Um, I, uh, because we only have five or seven minutes, um, I, I created a, a bibliography of a primer of some of the articles I found useful when I was um, looking into this, and it's on the uh, IHE table back there. I only run off 50 copies, but there's a couple articles that I think you can uh, quickly um, get a perspective because I won't have time to go over all of them. I want to highlight two quick um, biases. One was, and, and it of a multitude of uh, dozens of them, but one's called commission bias. I think we as clinicians tend, um, as Pat Crossgary says, that we have a tendency toward action rather than inaction, that errors of omission are stronger drivers for us than errors of commission. We as clinicians or docs have a, uh, feel compelled to do something uh, rather than not do something. It's much easier to do something. And actually some of the, the many system factors play into that. Um, things like uh, uncertainty. Oftentimes we aren't trained very well in terms of how to deal with uncertainty, how to manage uncertainty in our practice, and how, how to teach our new trainees to deal with uncertainty. And also to communicate to our patients that it's an uncertain business we're in. We, there is an element of uncertainty in all decisions. Another thing that influences commission bias is a, a um, uh, uh, physician's understanding of risk, um, probability, how uh, clinical tests, the attributes of clinical tests will um, enter into their decision making and, and that could be another area that we focus on. A, an unintended consequence of if I make an error as an emergency physician, I'm probably going to undergo some type of review process so the patient has an adverse outcome either by Alberta Health Services or by the college and it, I think very likely, um, the focus is going to be if I made a diagnostic error, why didn't I do a diagnostic test that might have picked that up? So uh, uh, that type of process of quality review of ad adverse events or misdiagnosis, well, as an essential aspect of improving care, may in a, um, yeah, has an understand consequ consequence of re reinforcing that commission bias. Um, so I, I run out of time here. I would like to spend more time and can wax on this uh, uh, topic. I, I'd encourage you to take a look at um, uh, the references there. Not, I've included two uh, articles that resonated with me by Pat Crossgary in the British Medical Journal Quality and Safety. Um, that talked about how to address some of those biases because obviously they're much more challenging or we would have fixed this problem a long time ago. So I, my hope is I've just kind of uh, created a little bit of interest amongst you to consider the topic of cognitive biases, how they influence our decision making as clinicians because if we don't address some of those root cause, we can invest 
a huge amount of effort in the HTA activities, in the, uh, all of this work on creating evidence guidelines, but if we don't change clinician behavior, that effort isn't going to result in what we want it to result in. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I especially appreciate your uh, comments around uh, uh, you know, complexity and uh, uncertainty. Um, that's certainly my world. I'm going to start talking about uh, the micro, and I'm going to end up kind of talking about uh, the macro. Uh, like I said earlier, I, I love systems. But I wanted to describe the system that I work in. I'm a family physician working under a fee-for-service system, which uh, incents a whole bunch of... Uh, you know, bad behavior, really, uh, at the end of the day, and which can't possibly deliver on some of the health outcomes that, uh, you know, we would all, I think, seek. Um, I'm in a, a group practice, uh, and I appreciate uh, having colleagues around. Uh, Ten FTE physicians, uh, physically, uh, we have like 13 to 14 docs uh, who work in there. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, a PCN support, so we have access to a small uh, collaborative team that is uh, made possible by PCN funding. So that's that's all good. I see about uh, 25 to 35 patients a day on average when I'm in clinic all day. We have uh, four to five uh, full-time equivalent kind of uh, other providers that we are able to uh, have help us in our work. Some of them are there part-time and some are, are there uh, Full time. Uh, on average, uh, you know we have a we have a busy day. Uh, not that my colleagues in other parts of medicine don't, but uh, you know primary care has been described as a complex adaptive system, and it does have a high degree of ambiguity and complexity. Undi undifferentiated uh, illness like in eMERGE is very very common, but in our case uh, there's also a very high density of. Uh, uh, for that patient encounter. And by that, what I mean is, uh, on average, family docs deal with at least three problems per visit, and uh, nearly half uh, deal with more than uh, three problems. And if any of you just think back to your last visit, uh, you know, that may or may not be true, but uh, on average, uh, you know, we, we deal with a lot of stuff. And we, uh, we're kind of forced by the fee-for-service system to kind of do this uh, somewhere between 9 and 16 minutes uh, per average visit. So that's kind of where I, I work. So when I'm talking about uh, evidence and how that uh, really uh, impacts on me, I, I think of uh, evidence in three, three different ways in the work that I typically do. Uh, first, through guidelines and standards of care for known conditions and stable chronic disease. Uh, so that's an important uh, part of what I see every day. The second is, uh, you know, the evidence-based strategies and interventions for screening and prevention of disease. And again, in Alberta, we've got a pretty nice infrastructure that has uh, provided, uh, you know, evidence and help uh, with, with that task. And then the third is uh, that scenario where I'm sitting in front of the patient and I'm really not sure uh, what to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'll go to an evidence-based source that uh, tells me what might be the next uh, appropriate diagnostic test or what is the uh, best current treatment approach for a condition that I think I've diagnosed. So those are the, how evidence applies to me in those three different ways. So, you know, uh, I appreciated some of the comments earlier about, uh, uh, you know, things that put in a nicer way, you know, I can delegate. And there's actually a lot of the work that I see in a day that could be delegated. And a lot of that involves stable chronic disease and the screening and prevention. In my clinic, uh, we have a group of uh, helpers uh, who are panel managers. We call them POETs, which are proactive office encounter techs, <laughs> which, is a, which is a term we stole from, uh, from a, a U.S. Uh, organization uh, in some measure. Uh, and and they, uh, they achieve uh, great results, uh, you know, uh, completed screening maneuvers uh, for all the top uh, uh, listed uh, interventions, uh, you know, in the 80 to 90 percent range, which is a huge improvement over what I could have ever done on my own. Uh, secondly, uh, the, there's, uh, you know, help that we get with uh, uh, chronic disease management, and, and most PCNs have... Uh, uh, some uh, resource that they can provide uh, clinics like ours. But o over and above that, uh, and until uh, we get the tricorder, uh, you know, uh, the undifferentiated illness and the complex patients still are going to require a physician or a nurse practitioner. And in my clinic, we are actually uh, fortunate to have a nurse practitioner. Um, so um, 
Other good things that I think we have going on in Alberta are uh, the result of work by Tina and others. And, uh, you know, our family medicines are taught and are very uh, competent in uh, the critical appraisal of evidence. And uh, we also, as practicing physicians, get opportunities for uh, CME around those topics. In addition, uh, our residents are provided, my understanding is, a subscription to decision support tools like UpToDate, you know, which uh, helps at that point of care. And uh, I know many uh, practicing physicians uh, use that uh, resource, myself included. But uh, the main barrier still preventing uh, theory from becoming practice uh, in primary care is the lack of opportunity for me to apply trusted evidence. Um, so, you know, when you look at the literature, solutions have been proposed, and, and really they're, they're pretty common sense sounding, and, and basically it, it involves uh, decreasing that density of the typical patient encounter in primary care. And that means either enabling a, a longer appointment duration, so I have more face-to-face -face time with my patient, so that I can do more of this uh, uh, kind of uh, application of evidence, possibly. Uh, or secondly, uh, as I've noted earlier already, uh, delegating more of the stable chronic disease management and the prevention work to people who could do it, probably better than me. Uh, currently, however, uh, you know, we, we have some access to these uh, kinds of things, but, but not full access. Uh, both of these uh, strategies could be accomplished by incenting uh, comprehensive care uh, through fee reform, which I'm happy to report is underway. But it's moving slowly, like many things in healthcare in Alberta seem to do, do frankly. And the second one is uh, also something that's in process, and that is implementing a, uh, an adequately funded a blended capitation model for physician remuneration. And again, we're, we're, we're a ways down the road to get there, but it's not quite uh, done yet. So if we could get these two things in place. The bottom line is we need more uh, collaborative team support. The fee-for-service model as it stands is not going to support that. We need uh, other kinds of uh, system level solutions. So I'm back to the macro here. Uh, we know from evidence also that investments in primary care uh, create important uh, and significant downstream savings. So uh, not unlike uh, the other analogy I heard earlier, where, um, you know, who wants to give up the money from their budget to invest in R&D? Uh, in Alberta's healthcare system, which is the second highest in Canada uh, for cost, as I recall or understand, uh, who's going to give up uh, money for the investment in primary care? And the harsh truth uh, to date is that uh, we haven't done that. And, uh, you know, I would say that that would be the next major innovation that we should be uh, looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah. I was hoping they would use up all the time so I wouldn't have to speak. But, uh, <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I, I would have accepted that. Um, uh, thank you for, for including me today. Um, so I'm, I'm at the micro level. I, in, in the Office of the Alberta Health Advocates, we... Um, respond to um, calls for assistance um, and support by Albertans who are uh, on a healthcare journey of some kind and they are asking for um, some level of, of, of help in that journey. Or um, we do have a, a, a number of people that call our office to report how good their journey has been. So we, we do hear both sides of, um, I can tell you that um, uh, some of the women that um, have been faced with breast cancer call to say that they just felt enveloped by the system and, and everything that they needed was wrapped around them. Um, and that, that's really good. We also hear where the rubber hits the road and things don't go so well. Um, so I, I, I've tried to gather some of those things that I will just throw out here for, um, uh, for consideration. I, I have to say that I'm really pleased that in the discussion um, this afternoon, I've heard so many references to patient engagement and patient-centeredness. Uh, 
And you know, that's new. We wouldn't have heard that two or three years ago at the levels that I've heard today, and I think that's really important. I, I think it is important to make sure that patients are engaged at all levels of public participation, not just at the, the survey or the focus group, but they're actually patients' voices at the decision-making of what research is going on and what programs we're, we're looking into, making sure we're bringing, bringing that voice to all levels. And, and I, I, in the acute care, I say from bedside to boardroom, um, because I, I think that there is room for that, uh, that public engagement. Um, a, a couple weeks after I was uh, invited to be part of the panel today, um, I was at a function and I did hear a question about, do you believe in evidence-based decision making? And the response was, it, well, it depends whose evidence and it, re it depends on how it's used. And I think that that reflects very much where patients are in this. Um, we need to keep in mind that when we're delivering evidence to patients, we have to balance it out with what matters to them. Because it, the, pa the evidence may be only one factor of what goes into a plan of action or, or setting goals for, for health outcomes. Um, patients are, um, are so individual in their preferences, their values, their circumstances, all of those social dynamics, um, they need to take into, into account in, in decision making. And, and the evidence may not al align exactly where the provider is seeing the evidence align in their life. So we need to be, be sensitive to that. I think we have a great deal of work to do in literacy for patients around evidence and around research and making sure that we heard a couple of references today in different languages, that's absolutely true in terms of patients. Uh, what we mean by certain words can vary drastically. Um, we need to make sure that patients are on a, a level playing field of, of understanding. Uh, some of the challenges that patients face is that there's so many pieces of evidence with differing views that I heard the word overwhelming, and, and it, it can be overwhelming. Uh, for me, I stopped at the red wine every day is good for you. I'm not looking at any other evidence. I, I'm just staying right there. Uh, that just is perfect for me. Um, in, in, in provider patient decision making, we have to make sure that we aren't imbalancing the relationship because then it stops being patient centered. We need to make sure that um, how, we, how we use evidence is actually supporting the relationship between providers and patients. Information can be power, and we don't want to upset that balance. We want to make sure that it can be used in a way that both, both people discussing it have, have some understanding. And also, there are situations in which patients have more time than providers to do the research and find out what the new evidence is. And, and that can be disconcerting for some providers. Uh, when the patient goes in with the binder full of recent information and they're asking for specific things. Um, we just need to be sensitive to those, those types of things. Often patients aren't cost conscious, or sorry, are co cost conscious in that they may not want more of everything that's available. I have to say after Brian's um, keynote this afternoon, he was so enthusiastic with how he was talking about drugs, I was getting quite excited about drugs. <laughs> um, but we, we need to be careful that um, evidence has been used um, uh, uh, for consumers in ways that um, try to get people to come along, even against their will for things. So we're, we're fighting that industry um, um, encouragement of, of, here's the evidence. You need to do this because here's the evidence. And we need to make sure that we're creating the opportunities to really discuss things. As um, providers are developing decision uh, tools and guidelines, we need to develop them for patients as well. We need to bring that along um, as well and making sure that, that um, it's, it is truly shared decision making we need to, to combine into this situation. A um, couple of other things. Um, uh, I, I took a look at Groupman's latest book, The Medical Mind, and, and talking about how uncertain science is and how individual patients are and making sure that we, we are always cognizant of that. Um, I think it's great opportunities for um, to 
have patients be able to understand diagnosis and, and management um, through conversations around evidence. And um, I've, I've recently had a personal situation where I've been able to sit with, with a specialist and go through what are the risks, benefits on do you take this medication or not. And, and I found that that was very empowering for me to do it. So I, I think that there are lots of opportunities for evidence to be used well. We just need to make sure that we're always bringing it back to the patient lens. Thank you very much. Are there any questions that anyone has for the panel? I think uh, you bring very important perspectives, very diverse perspectives, and I was quite happy to see that rather than just focusing on barriers, you each of you also looked at opportunities to be able to address those barriers and to look at some of the things that are actually working for you. So if anyone has any questions of the panel members, please come up and we'd love to entertain them. Hi, I'm a patient, a patient expert, patient uh, advocate, and I've seen the change over at least 50 years where I would go to a doctor and I'd be dictated what I was going to take and what I was going to do, and I probably wasn't even given a diagnosis. Today, however, it's flipped, and now I can walk in and see my doctors and sit and have a conversation. I get to learn about the ultra-rare disease I have, and they get to learn of my experiences living with it. So it is a, a real two-way thing. Where I'm coming up against barriers is if I'm going into an adrenal crisis and I call for a paramedic, and I'm trying to get everything out fast for them to be able to do what they need to do, I'll be told, what, are you a doctor? <laughs> Now that has to change. I walk, I'm the experienced one living with it, and if I haven't got time to get it out, I'm in a life-threatening condition. I'm in a life-threatening state. It's the same when I go into the ER. Oh, we need to do lab tests. No, 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 give me solucortia first. Then we'll discuss why I'm here. But don't be going off doing something completely different until I've had that injection. And it's just another way of, unless you hear it from the patient, because you don't see these patients very often, you're not going to learn from us. So just my point. I think it's, it, it's a very important point. Um, one of the things that we don't often do well is um, see the patient as an expert of their condition and their body. And we, my office hears a lot about, about the interaction people with chronic conditions that they know are predictable in terms of becoming acute at different times. And the interaction they have in, in the ERs um, can be very traumatic. Um, and uh, I think that that is something that we need to, to really work on. Um, do you have medical training? is a question that I hear all the time, <laughs> is, um, is something that somebody calls our office and says, this is what was just said to me. So it's something that we need to, to work with. It took us 100 years to build that culture, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's... Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and our new partnership it, it <laughs> has some working out. Uh, the, other, the other one is um, a 93-year-old woman asked for tea and a piece of bread because she'd been in ER waiting for hours and hours and she was told it wasn't a restaurant. Or the other one is, what do you think the H stands for, hotel? Um, so we hear those and we're working on those, but the culture has changed so significantly that, that I think we're, we're, we're well into culture change. And was the answer no, hell? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, uh, picking up on Brian's theme, but really for all of you, um, you know, the whole idea of the auto autom automation and commission, I've also heard it described as habitual behavior, habituation, and we all know how hard ha habits and habitual behavior are to break. So, how, how do we get at that, um, you know, in, in a system where we need, to, it's zero-sum game, we need to find the areas to save to invest in other areas. So just uh, some, some quick words of wisdom there. 
Yeah, I think there'd be a great career in consulting if there was an easy answer for that mm. and you could um, reproduce. I think it is a series of focused interventions uh, from how we train healthcare professionals to aligning um, uh, compensation and reimbursement with system goals. I, I think the Alberta Health Services and Alberta Health investment in Connect Care and that uh, evolution is going to be one of the biggest changes our healthcare system sees in Alberta and I think will put us ahead of everybody else in Canada. I think one of the focuses on that needs to be how can we enable the clinician, the nurse at the bedside, the dietitian, the respiratory therapist, the doc, to, how can we make it easier for them to do the right thing? Um, I'm not delusional to think an, an electronic health record is going to be a panacea. You can introduce many new sources of error and all kinds of different problems and inefficiencies with an EHR. But if, if we do that right as a system and create an environment that um, the clinical decision support tools are actually efficient for the nurse and the doc at, in the acute care uh, context or in the community care uh, setting and the pr practitioner there, um, we can enable them to do the right thing. We can also have much more granular data to take a look at uh, what the variation in practice is because right now the administrative data is that's a 30 or 40,000 foot level often not granular enough to differentiate between nuances and patients and, and determine whether a diagnostic or therapeutic intervention is appropriate. So just a, a few thoughts. I'm not sure what to say about the Connect Care comment other than my understanding is that primary care uh, and the system that I work in doesn't yet appear in the plan or architecture of Connect Care. So I'm not really sure how, how that's going to affect me. But I would say that uh, I've been messing around in uh, you know, innovation, I guess, in one way or another for a long time uh, now. Uh, and uh, what I, I think I've been taught or what I think I've learned is that a change and uh, innovation doesn't happen without discomfort. You have to upset the system a little bit. And, uh, you know, uh, to answer the question, how do we change behavior? Uh, we alluded to, to the discussion earlier about uh, comparing uh, ourselves to our peers, you know, uh, in an appropriate context. Nobody likes that. Nobody's comfortable with that. And when you first see your uh, performance, it's, uh, it's, it is upsetting. But uh, the evidence shows, I think, anywhere it's, it's done, that it does change behavior. And I would say that, uh, you know, we just need to do it. Uh, you know, like, who are we trying to please? Like, why don't we just do it? It's the right thing to do. There's evidence to support that. So let's go ahead and do it. We talk about it. We allude to it in, in a variety of ways, and we spend money around it, but we don't do it. So let's just do it uh, is one thing. Another uh, example I would give is, uh, uh, from what I understand about uh, surveys and uh, kind of feedback from uh, patient groups around formal attachment to a family doctor, they don't like it particularly, <laughs> right? They're, they're worried about um, their choice, which is understandable, but without any kind of education or uh, socialization of that concept, what could we expect? So, you know, patients don't want to be formally attached, but if they understood that it increases uh, continuity of care, uh, that, you know, all the outcomes are better. Uh, so again, you know, like, why don't we get on the ball and start socializing the concept of formal attachment? Uh, help people understand why government and physicians want to do this. Uh, there's good reasons for it. Uh, let's stop talking about it. Let's do it. Deborah, do you have any comments to add to Blair's no, question? Nothing, nothing to add. Okay. I think I thought there was some really interesting comments from our patient advocate. Um, there was a book came out a few years back called "The Patient Will See You Now." It was a really neat neat read. But I wanted to flip it around now for Alan and, and maybe even from Tina's perspective. A lot of patients are very knowledgeable; they're very ed well educated, and there are patients who get most of their information from the infamous Dr. Google, uh, and they're coming in with either a health app or a Facebook page, a wearable technology, and demanding that you do some diagnostic tests or prescribe a treatment for them. And, and how you're managing that situation and whether, Tina, your group has actually um, come out with some, some ways and some methodologies on how to, to manage that situation. Yeah, again, for me personally at least, uh, I don't really see the problem. Uh, my patients often preface their 
presentation of the of the of the sheaf of paper with you probably hate this but you know this is uh, this is what I've done and I actually have to correct them and say I actually want you to know everything you could possibly know about your situation because you uh, you can also come up with some good ideas and help me to figure out the best way to do things with you uh, in, 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 in reality, if you have the relationship, which is typical of a family practice, a uh, longitudinal uh, relationship over time, you can, you can have those kind of conversations. And you know what? They aren't the, the most onerous or uh, lengthy conversations I have by any stretch. Uh, it's usually something that's easily uh, discussed and easily managed. And uh, I think the vast majority of the time, at least I hope, uh, you know, we both uh, leave, the, leave that conversation happy, you know? So I welcome it personally. I want to follow that up uh, uh, with my two bits worth. I, I think it's really important that we as healthcare practitioners have that discussion because something's in the back of the patient's mind and if you don't address it, you are not going to uh, address their concerns. That doesn't mean I'm going to order an MRI and everybody coming into the emergency department, but I, I probably need to discuss them with them why that's not necessarily an appropriate test for their condition. Um, in answer to the Facebook, that is a big issue in terms of credible sources of information that are readily accessible to patients, and that may be something that we need to consider more. When you look at the Choosing Wisely program in the U.S., they've collaborated with Consumer Reports, and Consumer Reports has on their website uh, a series of different patient information about diagnostic tests, appropriateness of diagnostic tests, risk of diagnostic tests, and it provides a, a what I would argue is a balanced, unbiased um, perspective from a credible information source. In Canada, we don't have that equivalent, and um, I, in, the, in the absence of that equivalent, Facebook is going to fill the void, and uh, it's not that Facebook can't have credible information, but it can have a whole lot of um, very uncredible information um, that is very problematic, especially when we're trying to provide the best care for our patients and, and base it on good evidence. Tina, perhaps you could respond to that as well. Okay, uh, so um, a couple of things. Yeah, that's a fabulous question because we do encounter that a lot. And a few years ago, um, our group actually, we got a BMJ Christmas publication looking at the evidence around Dr. Oz. So that was a question that came up um, in our clinics because it wasn't Facebook or Google, but it, they would come in and say, Dr. Oz said I should do that. So we actually did a whole research project on that. Um, but I agree, and that's why I think um, most physicians actually find evidence empowering. And that's, we've done a few tools for practice, those one-page summaries. We've done one on vitamin D or multivitamins or what's the harms with uh, CT scans when people want a, a CT for their headache or what have you. So we're trying to address some of those and provide, again, just little pieces of evidence. Um, again, I, it's not so much frustrating as it is I like to have that discussion with my patients and say, okay, um, you find that interesting, but you know, this, is, this is the evidence around it. And again, it's, it's not my decision to make, it's your decision, but I will help you and inform you this is the best randomized control trial that showed you know, no benefit or a small benefit. And again, it speaks to, it's so empowering to have that evidence even in primary care level, and then we can actually have those discussions. Thank you. And I think Steve is next. Hey, Susan. So I'm Steve Buick from the college. I came partly just to tell Susan that I actually came. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm, a, I'm an old PR guy, so I specialize in pseudo evidence that means nothing and comic relief. So, so I thought one, one thing, I wanted to ask uh, if, if engineering is really the solution or if urgency is the solution, if just deciding that something has to change will make it change all by itself. So the stupid example that means nothing is a long time ago, I was a PR guy at the Misericordia, and the emergency doctors there uh, had no uh, ICU bed to put a patient in, uh, and they told me to go tell the media that there was one ICU bed left in Western Canada at that point. And guess what? Two hours later, that patient was in an ICU bed because the Minister of Health saw it on TV and said, somebody find an ICU bed, and they did. Now, so that means nothing. So let's talk about opioid prescribing, which Susan knows better than I do. So about a year ago, uh, the concern about opioid prescribing had reached ahead for various reasons, and the college had done various things. And a lot of different factors came together. And if you look at the statistics from one year ago to today, total opioid volume prescribed has dropped by 15%. Almost one unit of opioids in six has just stopped. 
because it became a crisis. The, the minister didn't say change it. The college, in fact, said change it. But mostly physicians just looked around and realized that, that the situation just had to change. Mostly, I think, physicians changed on their own. And partly, the college gave the official sanction, you know, the, reinforced the message that they had to change. So I wanted to just ask, do we really need to re-engineer how things are done, especially financially? Or can the system not identify when something has to change and make a change? Because opioids are an example where something had to change and did fast and the right way. Anyway, thanks. Who would like to comment on that? I'll, I'll, I'll say thank you for the college for sending those letters out. My call load went up by 20% and solidified my position in the ecosystem as being needed. <laughs> Yeah, my comment would be that that approach uh, really wouldn't uh, probably serve primary care very well because, um, as was alluded earlier, there's not that many bright and shiny objects uh, in primary care that we can kind of create that sort of uh, perception. So uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the truth of that. Another question over here. Hi, my name is Beth Kidd, and I'm with the Health Coalition of Alberta. We're a patient advocacy group that's uh, been around for about a decade. Um, Deborah, I appreciate your presentation in particular. A lot of the comments that you've made, we certainly hear from our members. Um, what I wanted to ask you about, though, is something that our members seem to be kind of coalescing around is um, the idea that our healthcare system needs to move from one that is task-based to one that is relationship-based. And what they're talking about is actually one that's responsive to the individual needs of patients versus ticking off a checklist of things that are supposed to happen. Where we hear this a lot, actually, is with seniors' health, and in particular with dementia care, as I'm sure you can imagine, around aging in place and the types of supports um, and the variety of needs that need to be met with that. But we also hear um, from groups who represent young adults, young adults with cancer, for an example, um, children or youth who are dealing with adult conditions. Um, an example of that is the prevalence of migraines with children and youth. And of course, there are, a lot of that treatment is based more around adult care, right, instead of children and youth. So what I'd like to ask, sorry, my long ramble, what I'd like to ask of each of you is how do you think it's possible for our healthcare system to move to that more um, individualized relationship type care that's hopefully more impactful for each patient? And what would it take to do that? In particular, actually, I was thinking about your comments around the fee-for-service model mm -hmm. and how, if that changed, that could possibly have a good impact on this move towards more individualized or relationship-based care. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I've, I've been uh, involved in, uh, with, with government and, and many others uh, developing the, the blended capitation model. Um, as it has evolved to in Al Alberta at this time. Alberta arrived at that uh, uh, conclusion uh, several years ago, in my view, in my mind, and in my experience, as a result of an IHE uh, uh, meeting uh, that, that actually occurred in which we, we looked at all the different kinds of uh, systems, remuneration systems, and, you know, uh, blended, blended capitation uh, it was and, and uh, in my mind still is the the best solution in to to answer the concerns that you uh, that you bring. Um, these things uh, to do in a quality way take a bit more time. If I had more time because I could delegate some of those other things, uh, I would have time for more of that kind of quality interaction with patients. I could apply evidence on a more consistent basis. Um, it, it would be a, it would be a great thing and. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're like this close to being able to hopefully roll out blended capitation, but there's some, uh, you know, there's a few, uh, there's a few uh, things that need to be worked out yet, uh, you know, to make it feasible and uh, reasonable and, uh, you know, where there would be a, a fair distribution of risk between the funder and the, uh, and the provider. So uh, at the end of the day, absolutely what you're saying is uh, true. And uh, in the meantime, we are, uh, through the uh, executive section general practice, we're trying to, in, in uh, we're trying to uh, make changes to uh, the fees uh, remuneration system, uh, so that it does favor comprehensive care, so that you know 
physicians who are, are willing to take that kind of time uh, can be paid reasonably for it and be able to operate a business, which is what we all do as uh, private contractors. My comment, I, in the emergency department, we have a rel relatively short time to make a relationship, uh, and the patients are often telling us their <laughs> deepest secrets about uh, their health care, um, and, and they don't really have much choice. They got me because I picked up their chart. Um, but to your point, I, I think it, it's incredibly imp important, and I, I, I would submit my personal opinion is the key to doing that is a, a a phenomenally strong primary care system as a backbone of system, not a walk-in clinic system, not a use the emergency department for primary care system, but a really empowered primary care system that we in the emergency department link with. So uh, that uh, conversation is I can communicate with my primary care colleague, let them know I saw the patient in the emergency department, this is what we've done, and uh, ensure that that care that's happened in the emergency department is part of the continuum of their care. So I, not an easy thing to accomplish, but I think one of the key steps is a really robust primary care system. Yeah. And lastly, Deborah, and then I think we're going to have to wind uh, up comments I for today. I would agree with those comments. I, I, I don't sit at a table that I don't hear about compensation um, as, as being a factor that needs to be addressed. And uh, um, I think I think having that handoff um, between community and acute care so that they aren't siloed. We've got so many silos in our system that if we break those silos down so that there's better communication, coordination, collaboration even, um, um, you know, there are some patients that need to go to acute care because of their conditions. That, that needs to be uh, handled much better between primary care and acute care. And I think, I think developing those relationships allows the patient to have a relationship uh, that they need to have in primary care. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I think the questions and comments afterwards were really robust and speaks to the high-quality uh, presentations that you each made. Thank you very much.